Because your cross is powerful, because you rose invincible, I can get up off the floor. This is my resurrection day, nothing's gonna hold me in the grave. This is my resurrection day, nothing's gonna hold me down. Say goodbye to my yesterdays, ever since I met you I am changed. This is my Because you crush the enemy, I can get up off the floor. This is my resurrection day, nothing's gonna hold me in the grave. This is my resurrection day, nothing's gonna hold me down. Say goodbye to my yesterdays, ever since I met you I am changed. This is my resurrection day, nothing's gonna hold me The good news, cause you rose up from the dust. Your gospel is the power that is saving all of us. So I can get up off the floor. Come on, get up off the floor. This is my resurrection day. Nothing's gonna hold me in the grave. This is my resurrection day. Nothing's gonna hold me down. Say goodbye. To my yesterdays, ever since I met you, I am changed. This is my resurrection day, nothing's gonna hold me down. This is my resurrection day, nothing's gonna hold me down. Great. This is my resurrection day, nothing's gonna hold me down. Glory to his name. That was a good song, and together we need to stand up and lift up our voices to his name. 489, if you need your hymn book. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin, Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross, there he took me in. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. Verse 4, come to this fountain so rich and sweet, cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. starting service off for us. Glad to have you here. With Jay leading the singing today, did he? That little course they learned around camp time or something like that, he likes that. Got a new song leader coming on the scene here. Glad to have you here with us this morning. Trust the service to be a blessing to you for coming. If you came in after Sunday school, let me introduce our, our special guest this morning. Evangelist Scott Pauling, and he's not a stranger to us here. And I, I truly believe one of the 
he's a speaker I like to I like to go here he's one of the few that I like to travel to go here and I always know going to hear something from the Lord the list is getting shorter from our day and age when we was starting off in the ministry you get a lot shorter of speakers that that you could trust that you get something from God that you know that uh, was something uh, for your heart I mean it just I'm glad Brother Scott's on the scene ministering to churches. I really am. And uh, But uh, so other special guest this morning is my mom from Winter Haven, Florida. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you get a chance to meet her. It, some new folks at church. This is my mom sitting right over here. And then my, my brother and sister-in-law, Mike and Sean Setzer from Winter Haven. So they're, they're going to be leaving after this, well, after lunch. I guess we'll have lunch. And then they're going to head on up to Ohio for a day or so. We got an, a new grandbaby to see, going to visit the gravesite for uh, the one-year anniversary of Poppy passing away. So now this morning, I got quite a few calls. I guess this RS, <laughs> I want to say, I don't know how to respond to that. There's this RSB going around, or, so for all the kids, the Adair family, the Belt family, and so like that, all affected by that this morning. For what reason? Several others. So anyways, that's, that's where some of our families are. And uh, I guess the East family had a, had a wedding or something going on there. I didn't even know about that. Okay. How about that? We have a wedding this Wednesday. Uh, Josh and um, Jessica Basham. And if you guys all remember with all the, the boys that all sit right here, their boys. Uh, Josh and uh, Jessica getting remarried this Wednesday. And uh, sometimes the Lord works in great ways to bring families back together and things like that. So that's, that's a special this Wednesday. Anyways, let's open with a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessings and, uh, on the service that we have before us. Holy Father, thank you for a good day to be in, in your house. We're grateful to be here, Lord, and thank you for the privilege. Bless Brother Paul as he speaks for us. And may the fellowship be great this morning in your will, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you if you'd like to have a seat. Brother Steve's going to lead us another hymn. 256, It Is Well With My Soul. <clears throat> when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well. my soul it is well it is well with my soul though Satan should buffet though trials should come let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well it is well with my soul. <clears throat> Verse 4. And Lord, haste the day when my face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. It 
it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Brother Scott will say something about his new book on the table in some portion of his service. So, uh, thanks for coming. Glad to have you here this morning. We've come into, uh, I think, our first really cold week of the year. And was it, wasn't it an eye-opener there? So lets us know what's coming in a few short months. But glad to have you here this morning. You can read through the bulletin. You'll see the announcements that are in it. And um, any, uh, any designated special gifts as far as love offerings for us, God, in the plate back there, we'll make sure that goes his direction. But uh, again, gra grateful to have you here. I'll ask Brother Scott to come and speak for us. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being here today. I really. Or you can just, hey, we found the button. That's good. <laughs> I was going to say, or you can just play one of your pastor's sermons, and I'll lip sync for Jesus, whatever you want me to do. But uh, we began this morning in a certain portion of the Bible. All you friends who are here in Sunday school, on the count of three, I want you to tell everybody the book and chapter. Ready? One, two, three. You did listen. Very good. Let's open our Bibles again to Colossians chapter number four. And we're going to read through these verses again that list for us a number of individuals and I want to bring you to a truth this morning that really has just captivated me as I've meditated on these people. You ever think about all the people you're going to meet in heaven someday? These are real people, you see. If I ask you, tell me what you know about Moses or David or Noah or uh, Joseph, you'd have something to say. If I said, tell me everything you know about Tychicus, I'd like to know what you know about Tychicus or Archippus. Or Epaphras. Somebody said, well, I'm not quite as acquainted with those people. Perhaps not. But aren't you glad that with the Lord there are no anonymous people? God knows every one of his children. And so when you come to a passage like Colossians chapter 4, and the Lord reminds us of certain individuals that Paul knew as faithful followers of Jesus, it's just a great reminder to me that no matter who you may be or what you may think others think of you, God knows exactly who you are. Look at Colossians 4 beginning in verse number 7. You may want to mark these names as we walk through the passage. All my state, Paul writes, shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They shall make known unto you all things which are done here, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, calls that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. And I want you to read verse 18 out loud with me, church. You have it in front of you, Colossians 4, verse 18. Ready? The salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. I got back yesterday from meetings out of town for several days. And I, I must tell you, I travel all the time, different regions of the country. I still, there's no place like the mountains of West Virginia to me. And whether I'm flying in or driving in, uh, this is my favorite time of year, but it doesn't matter time of year, this is my favorite place on earth. 
And uh, several years ago, when we went into evangelism, we decided to move back to the old family farm. And so I live on the property that I grew up on. In fact, we, we built a house on the field where my grandpa put me on a tractor for the first time when I was about 12 years of age and said, I need your help to get this hay done today, so this tractor's yours for the next few hours. And so a lot of memories, a lot of memories. Now, yesterday afternoon, my son and I, just evening, late, really, my son and I took a walk and walking across the property, and I must tell you, I could not help myself but thinking about my grandfather. He's been with Jesus now for a long time. I miss him. By the way, you kids did a great job this morning. Can I give you a recommendation? Enjoy your parents and enjoy your grandparents and spend time with them. I'd give anything. I really mean that. I'd give $1,000 right now. Right now, I'd give $1,000 if I could have an hour under the old cherry tree in front of my grandpa's house to sit and talk with him and ask him questions. You know, when you're young, you're dumb. How many of you know that? And you just, you don't think you're not going to have them forever. I should have asked more questions. My grandpa was a, was a mountain man. He was a World War II vet. He was a Navy man, electrician. He was at Pearl Harbor right after the attack and helped with all the cleanup. Before he died, we got to visit it with him. And he was a tough man, tough. Didn't ever express a lot of emotion. Uh, but uh, he stood there on top of that memorial and wept, looking at the names of all those men. Uh, he was a great man. He was a coal miner. Uh, you, you know this from living in this region, maybe, maybe some here today. Coal miners are a breed of their own, let me tell you. They're just tough people. <laughs> Grandpa was crawling through a coal mine one day, Pastor, and a piece of coal fell. A little piece of coal fell, cut half of his ear off. He picked it up, crawled out of the mine, got in his car, drove himself to the hospital and handed his earlobe to a nurse and said, sew this back on. And they did. And they didn't clean it out good, and they sewed a little grayish green line of coal dust into his ears there to the day he died. As a boy, I thought that was a badge of honor. I wanted one of those marks on my ear, you know. I thought, that's a man right there. Now, Grandpa was a, was a great man. He died when he was in his late 80s with his tomato steaks in his hand on his way to his garden. That's the way to go, dead before he hit the ground. And when I think of my grandfather, there are certain things immediately that come to my mind, remembrances, memories, qualities. I want to ask you a personal question this morning. I don't care how old you are. I want you to listen to me with your heart for a minute. How would you like to be remembered? When it's all done, how do you want to be remembered? My dad, before he started preaching, was in the cemetery business. And some people think that's very morbid, but somebody's got to do it, you know. And it's interesting. Whatever your dad does for a living, that's what you notice when you're, when you're driving along. We'd be on family vacation driving down the interstate. <laughs> Somebody in our car would say, that's a nice cemetery. Sound like the Adams family on vacation or something, you know. But we just, that's what we grew up around. It was normal for us. And I was just a boy. I got captivated by epitaphs. You know what an epitaph is, right? Little, little something that's put on a grave marker underneath the uh, name and uh, birth and death uh, years and the little dash that represents a whole lot of living. It's the one line that the whole life is boiled down to. I started collecting them. I've got a whole bunch of them, a lot of interesting ones, and people give them to me from time to time. And sometimes it's picked out by people before they die. Usually it's chosen by family members or friends, people that knew and loved them, after they die to reflect on their life and say, this is the one thing we remember about them. I ask you again, if you had to boil all of life down to something, what would it be? Can I tell you what I'm learning at this juncture on my journey? That the older I get, the longer I live, and the nearer I get to heaven, some things are meaning less and less to me, and other things are meaning more and more. It's funny, isn't it? When you're young, some things you just really want. And then when you get to a certain point in life, you start thinking more about the finish line than you do the starting blocks, and you realize that in the end, you're not going to be remembered for everything, but you're going to be remembered for something, and the only thing that really matters is what connects to eternity. When you come to this portion of the Bible, and all these names are mentioned, but as I've meditated on them in the last few days, I've realized that they're not just names, that in fact they're descriptors of these people that are woven all through this passage. This is how Paul remembered them. This is how the church at Colossae remembered them. This is how God Almighty remembered them. And I ask you again, how would you like to be remembered? I'd like to give you three little things, truths today, that all come from this passage. And some of this is testimony, if you'll permit me. This is how I'd like to be remembered. 
I was preaching in the North Georgia a few years ago. And one afternoon, a little, little tiny town, just a little village of a town and a little church, and we were having a sweet meeting, great time together. And one afternoon, I decided I was going to take a run. And uh, I ran through the little town, and ran on, I was running out on the road on the outskirts of town. And I got to a place on the road. There was a huge cemetery, massive cemetery. And it was a Civil War cemetery with all the little white crosses in it. I, I, um, I love history, and so I took a little detour and thought, I'm going to run the loop around this big Civil War cemetery. Did you know you run faster when you run through cemeteries? It's an amazing thing. But anyhow, I, I decided to make the loop, and I, I ran the loop all the way around. And I'd seen all these markers and memorials, and as I was coming back, to the front to exit. Off to my right, I saw the biggest monument in the entire park. I had noticed it coming in, and how I'd missed it. It was huge. And I thought to myself, knowing where I was, well, that must be somebody really important. That must be a general or commanding officer. I left the road where I was and I went over and got close enough to see and found out it was somebody really important, but it wasn't a general, not the way we think of a general. Uh, it was a commanding officer. It was a wife and mother. That's what it was. The biggest memorial in the entire cemetery was to a lady who was a faithful wife and loving mother. It had her name. It had that birth year and death year and the dash. And then it had her epitaph. I must tell you that in all these years, all the things I've ever seen printed on a grave marker, I've never seen anything that affected me more. <laughs> you know, I think sometimes God makes divine appointments for us. In fact, it affected me so greatly, I took my phone out and I called my wife and I said to her, I'm standing in a cemetery. She started laughing and she said, what are you doing there? And I said, well, I was on a little jog and took a detour. And I said, but I'm calling to tell you, I think I've just seen the greatest epitaph I've ever seen on a grave marker. And I said, I'm serious when I say this. If God will let me when I die, this is something like I'd like to be said of my life. And she said, what is it? I said, well, it's really simple. But she said, what is it? And I read to her what I was reading in front of me. It simply said of this woman, she lived and died as a Christian. You know what I've discovered? There's a whole lot of people who want to die as Christians. They just don't want to live as Christians. Let's take a survey. How many of you would like to finish well, and when it comes time for you to leave this world and meet God, you'd like to be ready? How many of you would like that to be true of you? Would you raise your hand? All right, listen to me. You don't pick that on the day of your death. You choose that today, and you choose that every day. You don't pick your epitaph when you die. <laughs> no. You're writing it now. The life story of your life is being recorded now in heaven's records book. And he keeps very good records, by the way. And I ask again, how would you like to be remembered? Let me give you the three thoughts that come from this passage. Would you write them down somewhere? Uh, maybe you may even want to make this the prayer of your life. Number one, I want to be remembered first as a family member. Now, I'm not talking about my physical family. I'm grateful for my family. Dad and mom, faithful Christians, thank God for them. I have one sister. I thank God for her and her family. My wife and I just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. That was wonderful. And we got three children that all look like their mama. Praise God for that. And Morgan's married now, and Lauren's 20 and serving in the ministry. And, and Grant's a senior in high school, and it's hard for me to imagine all of that. I love my family, but that is not the family I'm talking about. I'm talking, listen to me now, about a much better family. I'm talking about the family of God. Do you understand that family was God's idea? The psalmist said God sets the solitary in families. Do you understand that no matter what kind of natural or biological or physical family you have or do not have, God has made it so that every one of us can be a part of the greatest family in the world, which is the family of our God. Did you notice all the family language? Let's mark it. Look, please, at verse 7. When I stop... Say the next word. Would you look at verse 7? All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved what? Brother. Mark that in your Bible. He's a brother. Look at verse 9. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved what, church? Brother. Let me come down to verse number 15. Salute the what? Brethren. 
Let's do something, all right, just for fun. You're not allowed to look at me. I want you to look around you for just a second, everybody. Look around you. It's all right. The preacher says you don't have to pay attention for a second, all right? Turn around. I want you to look who's behind you. Look who's, who's behind you. Who's to your left, to your right. Wave at somebody you haven't seen yet this morning. Nice to see you. God bless you. Wonderful. Now, look at me. If you're a Christian and they are Christians, may I tell you, you are not just looking at fellow church members you are not even just looking at friends. You are looking at family members. We're brothers and sisters. <laughs> How is that possible? Look, the only way you can be brothers and sisters is you've got to have the same father. I love this. On the day you come to know Jesus Christ, God's son, as your personal savior, God becomes your heavenly father, and he places you by adoption and new birth into the greatest family in the world, into the family of our great God. And 41 years ago, I took Jesus by faith as my personal Savior. And I didn't understand all that then. I'm just starting to understand the glories of it now. But on that day, 41 years ago, as a boy, God placed me into the family of God. And I want to tell you this morning, there's nothing like being a part of God's family. And it's funny, but week after week, I'm in places where I don't know anybody. This week, I was in Kansas, and... and uh, I, I didn't know, literally did not know a handful of people in the whole room. And the most amazing thing, I showed up feeling like a stranger. In about 10 or 15 minutes, I felt very much at home. How is that even possible? And it happens week after week after week. I'm going to tell you how. Because after a while, you start connecting with members of the family of God, and you understand we have Christ in common. There is nothing like being one of God's family members. And so this passage begins here with the most important thing, which is this, your relationship, not to each other, but your relationship to the Heavenly Father. May I ask you, are you really a family member? Just because you're a church member doesn't mean you're a family member. No. There are people all over this country whose names are on a church roll somewhere, but they're not written down in the Lamb's Book of Life in Heaven because they have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In the good providence of God, God put a businesswoman next to me on a flight coming back home this week. And, uh, you know, when people find out they're seated next to a preacher at 30,000 feet, it's one of two responses. They're either really glad they're sitting next to you or really wish they weren't. You understand? And she was a kind lady. She really was. And she was interested in where I'd been and what I was speaking on and what I did for a living and all that kind of thing. But she'd already told me where she was headed to, and she was, she was headed to meet some friends and to be involved in some things, frankly, that Christian people ought not be involved in. And she wanted to then back up and tell me the church she belonged to and her religious background. And it just reminded me all over again. And I said to the woman, I said, you know, church is wonderful, but there's nothing like having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It just reminded me all over again that just because people come into buildings like this on Sunday, just because they claim to have a church home somewhere, does not mean that they have a heavenly home. I ask you, are you a member of the family of God? If I stand in the garage, that doesn't make me a car. And if I sit in a church, that doesn't make me a Christian. Do you know that your sins have been forgiven? Do you know that your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life in heaven? Do you know that the Spirit of God lives inside of you? Do you know that if you die today, you're ready to meet God just exactly like you are? I'm going to tell you, this is not a time for people to have question marks about their eternal destiny. This is a time to make your calling and election sure. Drive a stake a mile deep in the ground about your soul's salvation. And might I just say, don't leave any doubt about it when you leave this world. You're talking about the father and grandfather leaving this world a year ago and being buried. Now, this, this, is, this is interesting to me, uh, but the, the ground they're going to visit tomorrow as a family, that's resurrection ground. That's what that is because, look, he's not there to start with, and number two, his body's going to come out of that grave someday. That's a glorious thought, isn't it? But may I just remind you of something? There are a whole lot of people whose family members leave this world and they leave no definite testimony behind about their saving faith in Jesus Christ. Don't you leave your kids and your grandkids wondering and worrying about where you are in eternity. You give a clear testimony of faith in Jesus Christ and be remembered as a family member. In fact, if I could give you a practical suggestion, write out your salvation testimony somewhere. Put it on paper somewhere. Rehearse it with your family. Let me meddle a moment. Did you know there are people that grew up in Christian homes and they could not tell you how their parents ever got saved? 
They're, they're people who are in Christian marriages, and they don't know how their spouse actually came to know Jesus as their personal Savior. I'm going to give you a homework assignment. Forgive me for using a dirty word in church, kids. I'm going to give you a homework assignment, all right? On your way home from church today, in the car, why don't you share with your family how you came to know Jesus as your Savior? Or around the lunch table today, why don't you go around the circle? You don't have to give your life story. Give the 60-second version. But tell them how you came to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Don't let there be any doubt in your mind about it, and don't let there be any doubt in your family about it. You're a member of the family of Almighty God. I was preaching somewhere the other day, and I'm trying to remember where I was. And at the end of the meeting, I, I had people to, to get with someone and share their gospel testimony, their 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 story of how they got saved. I love how God works. Don't you love how God works? Look, no preacher can orchestrate this kind of thing. I'm just trying to encourage Christian people to talk about the goodness of God and let the redeemed of the Lord say so and all that kind of thing. And in that meeting, there were two women that got together and the one woman shared her story of faith in Christ and how she knew the Lord as her Savior. And when she finished, the other woman said, I've never been saved. <laughs> And the Christian woman sat her down in the building. I didn't even know. I didn't even know it was going on while it was going on. Sat her down in the building, showed her from the Bible how she could be a member of the family of God. And this preacher didn't lead that woman to Christ. Another member of the family of God in that room led that woman to Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing like being a member of God's family. Settle it once and for all. This is the second thing I see in this passage. Not only do I want to be remembered as a family member, number two, I want to be remembered as a fellow worker. As a fellow worker. In other words, I want to get off the bench and get in the game. Pastor, we got too many spectators in churches, not near enough participants. Our American Christianity, which is a thousand miles from Acts Christianity, has almost given people the idea they can come into beautiful buildings and sit in comfortable pews and listen to a guy like me perform on a platform for 30 minutes, and they've done God a favor. I want you to know that God did not design the Christian experience to be one where we are observing other people. It is to be one where we are actively engaged in the work of the Lord ourselves. And I love all the, the fellow words. Pastor, if you announce you're going to have a fellowship here, typically that means one thing. What does it mean? Food, right? Yeah. And I'm for that. I like food. Don't get me wrong. Let me show what real fellowship looks like. Would you mark three words in your Bible? In verse number 7, I want you to mark the word fellow servant. That's a beautiful expression. You know what that word is? It's a reminder that we have the same master. Our fellowship is because we have the same master. We are fellow servants. And then, come down to verse number 10. This is not nearly as happy a word, but it's a reality. And mark the word fellow prisoner. He said, this man's my fellow servant, but this man is my fellow prisoner. What does this mean? It means not only do we have the same master, we bear the same reproach. We fight the same battles. We deal with the same flesh, and we deal with the same conflict. We're in this thing together. But then come to verse number 11 and mark a third word. Mark the word fellow workers. What does that mean? It means we have the same mission. And what is that mission? To advance the cause of Jesus Christ in this world. Pardon me, but polite Christianity never changed the world. And people come into church to check a box and throw some money in the offering plate and nod their head at the preacher and walk out that door and live the same from one Sunday to the next. That is never going to make a difference for eternity. Let me tell you what will. When God's people say, I'm a member of the family of God and I'm glad, but I don't want to just go to heaven by myself. I want to take some people with me. I want to be one of the fellow workers that helps get the gospel out and bring people into Jesus Christ. And I wonder, are you engaged in it? It's a deeply personal message. What are you doing to take people to heaven? You personally. I'm not asking about this church collectively. This week, did you give your testimony to anyone? Do you carry gospel literature with you to speak to people? Do you look for divine appointments? Have you spoken to the people that moved in and down the street from you? You know the people that bought that house. You ever wonder why God let them move to your road? How about the people you work with or go to school with? Do you understand what fellow workers do? Fellow workers don't just fellowship in the church house, in the building. God in heaven, have mercy on us. The Great Commission doesn't say open the church doors and let all the lucky sinners come find us. It says go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
You want to see this region touched for God? Then unbottle it, uncork it. Get it outside the church house. Get it outside the local fellowship of believers and let God's people become fellow workers. Watch this. As surely as not every church member is a family member, not every fellow believer is a fellow worker. And God's people have to start taking seriously what we're doing for the gospel's sake. Are you glad you're going to heaven? Let's try that one more time. Are you glad you're going to heaven? Let me ask you one other question. Who are you taking with you? Who? People say they want to see everybody saved. You don't want everybody saved if you're not after somebody. Must I go in empty-handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him? Must I empty-handed go? When you stand at the judgment seat, who will point at you and say, that man led me to Jesus? Who will point at you and say, that girl prayed me to Christ. That family loved us to God. Those people got me the gospel. Who will say you were the fellow worker that found their place and did their part to simply get Christ to them? Let me show you something really interesting. Go back to verse number 11. Look at the expression here. He said, these only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God. Sounds like they're in the minority, doesn't it? You ever wonder why Jesus said his one prayer request was pray for laborers? I'm understanding it more and more because very few people are real laborers. Most are willing to sit on the sidelines and say, praying for you, preacher. These only, he said, are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God. And notice this, which have been a comfort unto me. Do you see that word comfort? Circle that word comfort in your Bible. That doesn't mean a pat on the back. Do you know the word comfort here is the word for medicine? <laughs> Let me tell you what brings some medicine to a church. When some people say, you know what, we've got to do our part. Preacher, what can we do to help you get the gospel out here? That's a medicine to a preacher. That's a medicine to a church. That brings, that brings some freshness and wholeness and health to a congregation. You want to take your medicine, church? Then let God's people say, we're not content to simply go to heaven from here. We want to reach the world from here. We are family members, and we want to be fellow workers. I ask again, how would you like to be remembered? One more. Did you notice this key word? In verse 7, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a, here's the key word, faithful minister. Would you circle the word faithful? Verse 9, With Onesimus a, what? Faithful and beloved brother. Hmm. Now come down to verse number 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, what's this word? Always. Write down a third thing. I, I want to be a family member. I want to be remembered as a fellow worker. I'll tell you what I really want. Bottom line, I want to be remembered as a faithful man. Pastor, how many years have you been in this church? It's amazing to me. May I just tell you, preachers are a dime a dozen. But faithful men, they're rare. They're rare. The more pastors I'm with, the more I admire people who've just gone somewhere and stayed. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of hop, skip, and jump going on in the world. And it's not just true of preachers. That's true of people, God's people, you know, moving from place to place. By the way, if you, if you view this as a, a family, you won't be so quick to leave. People leave churches. Maybe they never leave this church, but people leave churches. And they, you know how they leave? Because they have a falling out with friends, you know, friends. So they leave those friends and go find new friends. May I just tell you, this is not a group of friends. This is not a civic group. This is not an organization. This is a family. Look, family is forever. Family works through things, and family stays with it. Family sticks it out, right? May I say to you, what we need is revival of faithfulness. Proverbs says most men will proclaim everyone his own good is but a faithful man who can find. The apostle Paul wrote that it is required in stewards that a man be found what? Faithful. And I wonder, will you be remembered as a faithful person? My parents are getting ready to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. I respect it. They've been faithful to one another. They've been faithful to the Lord. I go to churches and I see people who've been through church in the same church for 50 years. And you know what I think? I think those people have seen a lot of ebb and flow. Because in 50 years, friends, lots of people come and go. There are ups and there are downs. But you know what? The faithful people are the people that keep the thing moving forward. You may not be everything, 
You may not think you're much, but I'm going to tell you one thing every one of God's children in this room can be. You can determine by the grace of God that from this day to the day you see Jesus face to face, you're going to be a faithful person. And you know what's really interesting? We actually have a little glimpse of it in this, in this list. Did you notice it? Look at some of these names. For example, in verse number 11, do you see the name Demas? Anybody remember Demas? Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Or how about this one? Back up to uh, verse number 10, Marcus. Anybody remember Marcus? That's John Mark. Remember? On the middle of a missionary journey, what did he do? He turned back. So you've got Marcus who turned back and Demas who turned aside and sandwiched between the two, there's another man. Oh, I love this. Look at verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician. Somebody said he was a medical doctor. He was more than that. He was a man who was committed to Christ, committed to Paul, committed to the advancement of the gospel, committed to the church. He was a faithful man, and I can prove it to you. Turn over just a few pages in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 4 for a second, would you? This is the last thing the apostle Paul ever wrote. See if some of these names sound familiar. He's writing to Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me. In Colossians 4, he was there. By 2 Timothy 4, he was gone. Having loved this present world. Time out. Stop. Everybody look at me. Lift your head and look at me just a second. How many of you, don't have to tell me who, how many of you know there are people who have sat in these pews that aren't in these pews anymore? They were serving Jesus, and they are not now. How many of you can think of anybody like that? Would you raise your hand, please? All right, look, please. Don't ever be that person. Don't ever be that person. Keep reading. He's departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia, and then notice this expression. I think it's one of the most tender in all of the Paul's writings. Only Luke is with me. Now, praise God, Mark came back. The rest of the verse shows Mark returned. Some people leave and never come back. Some people leave and return. Let me tell you who I want to be. I want to be the guy who never left to start with. And that was Luke. And to the very end, Luke was a faithful man. Where will you be 10 years from now? I hope we'll all be with Jesus. I hope the Lord comes. But if Jesus tears his coming and God lets you live, where will you be 10 years from now? And what will be the testimony of your life? And when your children and grandchildren walk past a casket someday and pick out a burial plot and put something on a grave marker, how would you like to be remembered? I, I'm testifying now. I'm not preaching at you. I'm, I'm telling you from my heart and from the word of God. I want them to say, my daddy was a Christian. He was in God's family. He was, he was a child of the king. He belonged to the Lord. He was a family member. I want them to say, my daddy was a fellow worker. Now, he gave his life trying to get the gospel out and point other people to Jesus. He, he didn't keep it to himself. He helped to get it out. And I want them to say, by the grace of God, if nothing else, my daddy was a faithful man. He was true to his wife, true to his family, faithful to his church, faithful to the calling God put on his life. He was faithful to the very end. Hear me, church. It's one thing to start well. It's quite another to finish well. And I wonder, how would you like to be remembered? Do you know the name David Livingston? How many of you know the name David Livingston? Famous pioneer missionary of Africa. To this day, there are places in Africa named for Livingston. He was an amazing man. As a matter of fact, uh, he was offered huge sums of money to come back to England and teach at, uh, at Oxford and at Cambridge And they said, just come back and teach, and you'll be set for life. He turned all of it down. At the end of his life, he could not walk. They carried him on a cot from village to village to tell of Jesus. Did you know he died on his knees praying? Somebody came in to check on him in the middle of the night. He was down on his knees, and they watched him for a moment and realized he'd stopped breathing. He had gone to heaven while he was talking to God. That's a pretty good way to go, you know. He was a faithful man. When he died, they shipped his body back to England. Before they did, they cut his heart out. The African people said to the people in England, his body belongs to you, but his heart belonged to us. And they cut his heart out, and they buried his heart under an oak in Africa. They shipped his body back to England. On the day that David Livingston was buried in Westminster Abbey, the whole town shut down. 
Now, what had he done? Preached the gospel. Been a faithful man. Did what God gave him to do. They literally lined the streets to pay homage to a man who had given himself to God and given all that he had. That's David Livingston. Did you know he had a brother? It's funny. Even the people who know the name, even vaguely, of David Livingston have never heard of John Livingston. But did you know that in their lifetime, John Livingston was one of the most respected men in all of England? He grew up in the same church as his brother, same family, heard the same sermons, same pastors. It took different paths. David Livingston gave himself to God and what God had for him. John Livingston said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a lot of money. And he did. He succeeded. He became one of the most famous attorneys in all of England. His name was a household name. People knew the name and respected the name of John Livingston. Had a massive estate, an enormous fortune. Nothing wrong with being an attorney. Nothing wrong with making money. Nothing wrong with any of that. But he did all of it without giving much thought to God and eternal things. He was dying. All of his family came in, gathered around the bed to say the goodbyes, their I love yous. After several minutes, one of the sons said to his father, Dad, when you're gone, how would you like to be remembered? He said, he said all of this empire that you've built and, and all that you're leaving behind and all of, the, all of the things that you have constructed in your lifetime and set in motion, we're going we're to erect a massive monument to your life and your legacy, and we want to put the right thing on it. What would you like to be your epitaph? They said John Livingston never hesitated. He very quickly said only one thing. I'd like you to put on my grave these words. Here lies the brother of David Livingston. See, it's a funny thing, but the closer he got to the end, to the edge of eternity, and to seeing God, the more he realized that the only thing that really mattered in this world was what mattered in the world to come. And you know the sad reality? Some people live their whole life before they ever figure that out. And I came to say to you this morning, you're going to be remembered for something. And by the way, it's not just remembered here. You're going to be remembered there when you meet God at the judgment seat for something. How would you like to be remembered? Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if somebody could say, he, she, lived and died as a Christian. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me for just a moment, please? I'd like you to sit quietly, prayerfully for a moment. I'd like you to think about your life. And I'd like you to go beyond your life into eternity. Take one step into eternity. How would you like to be remembered? I'm going to ask every person in this room to respond this morning. Everybody. Every person. If it's all right, I don't think we'll have any music today for the invitation, and that way we can just all pray, and the only sound in the room will be the sound of, of people praying. No music. Let me ask a couple questions. Would you be an honest person? How many people in this room today can honestly say, Preacher, if I died right now, or Jesus came right now, and I stood before God, I know for certain, I know for certain that I'm one of the family members. I'm going to the Father's house. I know that I really am a Christian. I've been saved. The Lord Jesus lives in me. I'm not perfect. I'm certainly not the person I ought to be. But I know that I have received his salvation. That is a settled fact. I'd like you to raise your hand as high in the air as you can get it. Keep it up, would you please? Big and high towards heaven. And with your hand raised to heaven right now, would you just take a second and thank Jesus for saving you? Would you just thank him right now? Because if it wasn't for Jesus, you couldn't say that. Would you just say to the Lord, thank you for dying for me, 
rising for me and saving me. Praise God. Aren't you glad you know Jesus? You may lower your hands, and I must ask this question. And before I ask it, before I ask it, I want to give you my word. I will not embarrass you. I'm not in, into that. I don't like to be humiliated. I won't humiliate you, but I want to pray for you. Who is here today that would say, Preacher, I could not raise my hand a moment ago with confidence in my heart because it's not a settled fact. I do not know for certain. I am not 100% sure that if I died today or Jesus came today that I'm going to heaven. I don't know that, preacher, but I know this. I don't want to go to hell. Brother Scott, would you pray for me? I'm not certain of my soul's salvation. No one else is looking. I'd like you to slip your hand up in the air with mine long enough for me to see it and then pull it back down and say, pray for me. I'm not certain I'm saved. I know parents are sensitive to their young children who are here today. I'm grateful to God for that. May I say something to you? If you are here today or you're listening today and you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, only Jesus can forgive your sins and save you. Only Jesus. But he will if you'll trust him. In fact, if I didn't know Jesus as my Savior today, right now, right now, I'd repent of my sins and I'd say to the Lord, Lord, forgive me. And save me. You can pray that right now. Anyone, anywhere. Lord, save me. I don't want to be lost. Save me. Trust him today. Best I can tell, I'm speaking by and large to Christians in this room, and I'm glad. But I want to say something. In a moment, in a moment, when we come to pray, and Christians come to pray, if you're here today and you're not sure you're saved, you're not sure your sins have been forgiven, you're not sure you're really a Christian, I'm going to invite you to come, and I'm going to meet you right here. I want you just to come and say to me, I want to be saved, and we'll have somebody show you from the Bible how to have your sins forgiven. Don't leave without Jesus today. Don't leave without Jesus. I'm looking for the most part, a room full of believers, and I'm glad you know the Lord. So let's go down the line. You're a family member. Good, wonderful. Well, let's go deeper, further, higher than that. Would you be honest? How many Christians in this room today would say, Brother Scott, I'm saved, but there's some things in my life that aren't what they ought to be. I, I wouldn't want to meet the Lord exactly like I am right now. There's some things I just need to come clean with God about, give to the Lord, yield to Christ, and the Holy Spirit's convicting me as a Christian. That's me. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand with mine right now? You say, I'm saved. God's speaking to me. Thank you. Amen. That's several of us. That's several of us. I'm going to ask every one of you, every one of you in a minute, to, to lead the charge to this altar and leave your place in a second when I ask the first people out of your seat to come and tell God what you just told me. Let's go a step further. How many Christians would say, Preacher, I'm trying to live the Lord, for the Lord. I'm in church. I'm trying to do right. But today I realize I've got to get out of myself a little bit, and out of my comfort zone, out of my routine, and I've got to become one of the fellow workers. I've got to do more to get the gospel out. Preacher, I want to be a better witness and testifier. I want to point people to Christ. I want God to use me. And today I want to ask the Lord help me not just be a Christian, but to make a difference in the lives of other people. That's me. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand with mine right now all over this room? Amen to that. Amen to that. That's so encouraging. Let's go to the ultimate. I'm going to raise my hand first on this one. How many men, women, and young people today would say, Preacher, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. But I want to be one of those people faithful to the end. I don't want to be Demas, and I don't want to be Marcus. I want to be Luke. I want to be the guy who stays the course till I see Jesus. Preacher, would you pray for me that I'll finish well, stay right, and be faithful? Would you raise your hand with mine right now? Amen. I said I was going to ask every person to respond, so here's what we're going to do. Would you listen to me very carefully? In a moment, I'm going to begin a prayer. I'm not going to say amen because I'm not ending it. I'm just starting it. When I finish my part of the prayer, just to make it very simple and plain, I'm going to count to three. And when I do, I'm going to ask every person in this room that knows God's speaking to you today. Either you need to get something right with the Lord, you need to dedicate yourself to be one of the gospel workers of this church, or you're asking the Lord to help you be recommitted to him and faithful to death. Whatever it is God's spoken to you about, you raised your hand. I'm going to ask you, if you're physically able, I'm going to ask you to leave your seat and come join me in this altar. If you can kneel, kneel. And if you can't kneel, stand. <laughs> 
And if you can't stand, sit on the front row. <clears throat> but we're going to close. <clears throat> we're going to close this service this morning praying. And not just talking about it, but talking to God. And asking the Lord to help us to be remembered for the right things. Father, would you seal the truth to our hearts and etch it on our souls by the Holy Ghost? May the Word dig deeply and may God's people, young and old, respond to the truth of God today. 